Hey there, winemakers. My name is Grant Kramer, and I am a professor emeritus at the University of Nevada, Reno. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today, we're going to be diving into one of the key steps of winemaking, racking of the wine. And after that, we'll go into sulfiding the wines to protect the wines from oxygen and spoilage organisms. If you're making wine at home, these are essential steps that you'll need to do to get good results. So stick around. The wine fermentation has completely stopped, so it is time to rack the wine off. Before we get started though, we need to sanitize all of the equipment. I'm using StarSan for sanitizing, but you could use potassium metabisulfite solution as well. There are two ways that I'm going to discuss for racking wines. One is with these kegs that you see here, using pressure from a nitrogen tank to push wine along from one tank to another. In this case, I'm just pushing the star sand that I used in one container into another. And this way it cleanses the valves and sanitizes the other tank as well. The advantage of using the kegs is that I'm pushing with nitrogen gas so the wine is not exposed to air or oxygen, and there are no pumps involved. The other way is a more traditional way, which is utilizing glass carboys and transferring wine from one glass carboy to another, racking off the wine off of the lees or the dead yeast at the bottom of the container. With the glass carboys, you have to start the racking by siphoning the wine and letting gravity feed it into another container as I'm about to do here. This particular siphoning system uses pressure to push the wine up to the top and get the flow to occur. You don't want to use your breath, although that's the easiest way to go, but you may be blowing in some germs. So some people advocate a filter. On the other hand, since I've got a nitrogen tank, I'm simply going to pressurize the wine with my nitrogen tank and get the flow going. Here I am racking the wine into a keg rather than a glass carboy. I am doing this to minimize the exposure to air because I will put nitrogen gas in the tank and keep it protected. Once the flow starts, it continues to pull the wine through the siphon and into the tank by gravity. So the tank below must be lower than the level of the tank above in order to continuously get a flow. And then you have to be careful about the tubing that is going down into the bottom of your container that you don't put it all the way to the bottom and suck up the leaves at the bottom of the tank. So you have to put the tubing just above where that lee level is at. As a consequence, you're gonna lose some wine at the bottom. And this is why you need more than five gallons to be able to keep the carboy completely full as we'll discuss later. Now for the five gallon carboy, we will mix that end into the keg along with the three gallon carboy. Hopefully we'll have enough wine to fill a five gallon carboy all the way up to the top. To ensure that my wine is off of the air or the oxygen, I'm going to pressurize my tank with some nitrogen. I'm gonna put some pressure in and then I'm gonna release the pressure valve to let the nitrogen flow through, pump a little bit more nitrogen through to be sure all the oxygen is out of the top of the tank. Currently my wine is in this tank right here. It's protected because I put pressure in it from a nitrogen gas tank, which keeps the oxygen off the wine and protects it. However, it needs to be racked off in order to clarify the wine. Rack Racking is the process of transferring wine from one vessel to another, leaving the lees or the sediment behind, thus clarifying the wine. This helps to prevent the development of off flavors and continues to clarify the wine over time as sedimentation continues to occur. 
So we need to transfer it off of whatever remaining leaves are there. Those are the dead yeasts that are remaining suspended in the wine that are falling out to the bottom of the tank. I can transfer them into another keg and keep it all under nitrogen gas and not expose it to oxygen. This is a desirable way of doing it. But for the purposes of this video, I'm also going to show you the traditional way, which is that we rack normally from another carboy, but I'm in this keg, as I said, and we'll rack it into a glass carboy. In the carboy, we can see how clear the wine will be and how it is settling out over time. In the keg, we cannot see it, but we can be assured that over a couple of months, sediments will settle out and we can keep racking it. And those sediments tend to stick to each other. So we may stir up a little bit because the tubing in this keg goes all the way to the bottom of the tank. We may stir up a little bit, but if we do this a couple more times over several months, each time racking after every month or so, or two months, uh, we will eventually get the wine clear by springtime. And then this way it's protected against oxygen. This will be the procedure I will use for this winter, but for demonstration purposes, I'm going to show you how it's racked into a glass carboy so you can see the process. So I've started the siphon and the flow from the keg into the carboy has begun. Be patient, the flow takes a while to transfer the wine from one container to the next. And it is dependent upon the pressure gradient between the two tanks. The higher the tank is above the other tank, the more pressure one can get. You wanna keep the siphon tube down at the bottom of the keg as far as you can, or the container, so that you can get as much wine out of the keg as possible. So I wasn't able to get a completely full carboy. You can see at the top here that there's quite a bit of a surface layer here, which we don't want to get. So I'm going to have to top up my wine, even though I took some, had some leftovers that I put in there to fill it up as close as I could. It wasn't quite five gallons. So what I'm going to do is go out and buy some rosé wine, some cheap rosé wine, and add it to top this off. So I bought my cheap rosé wine with a similar color as my wine, and now I'm going to add it. Ultimately, I add just a little over two bottles of wine to top it off. This is what you want it to look like at the top, with a very minimum of surface area. Okay, we're still not done here. We still have to sulfite the wines. With time, the sulfur dioxide goes down and the wine becomes unprotected. We need to boost the sulfur dioxide concentration to protect it against oxidation and spoilage organisms. Sulfur dioxide is critical for long time aging of your wine. Without sulfites, your wine can develop off flavors or even turn into vinegar over time. If you're unfamiliar with how to add sulfite or potassium metabisulfite, then I encourage you to go view my video in how to measure SO2 concentrations in a wine, which is what I'm doing here. You can find that in my wine science series. There are multiple ways to measure SO2 concentrations in the wine. Some are useful, some are not very accurate. Here I am using the Ripper method. Again, you can get a further discussion of this in my previous video on SO2 measurements. Basically, the Ripper method utilizes a wine sample, some starch solution, and some sulfuric acid. Then you titrate in a small amount of iodide until all of the SO2 is bound up and the dye will turn blue. The reaction is complete when the liquid turns blue for more than 30 seconds. So I need to add one gram of potassium metabisulfite to this wine that is already at 17 parts per million and I wanna bump it up to close to 40 parts per million. 
So one gram will raise it to about 20 parts per million because my pH is about 3.2 or 3.3 in that area. It doesn't have to be that precise, but close enough. It's too difficult to weigh out one gram on my kitchen scale. So I made up a solution of 20 grams of potassium metabisulfite in 100 milliliters. That means that every five mils of the solution, I will add one gram of potassium metabisulfite. So that makes it much easier and much more precise. So that's what I'm going to do here. I have a five mil pipetter here and I will bring it all the way up if I can. And add that to my solution. And now my potassium metabisulfite sulfur dioxide concentration should be where I want. I'm going to let it sit here for a day, let it mix in, and I'll do another test of the sulfur dioxide with my ripper method to determine actual concentrations of SO2 in my solution and adjust it if I need to. Well, there you have it. We've racked the wines off of its sediments and we've sulfided the wines to protect it. These are essential steps in the making of a clean, fresh, flavorful wine. One has to have patience over time to keep racking this wine and one has to have precision in the measurements of the SO2 in order to not over sulfite the wines, but also to protect the wines so we don't want too little. We don't want our wine to turn into vinegar. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, then I suggest you like the video and subscribe to my YouTube channel where you'll find other useful tips on winemaking, plant physiology, and even viticulture. Have a great day.